Shalom. You know who I am. I'm Brad. And I'm with the Wild Branch Ministry. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for watching the God is Smarter Than We Are program. And I'm hoping and praying that uh, some of your young uh, teenagers and so forth uh, are, are coming and watching these programs as well, since I'm trying to aim them uh, at the youth. And I hope it has been a blessing to you to see that clearly the end is always revealed out of the beginning and that that's where the Father has taken us these days. And I hope as you watch these programs on the Hebrew Roots Network that they will be a blessing into you and that you will see their practical use in your life because we just don't want to do a bunch of religious stuff here. What we're saying and doing should make a difference in your life and everything you set your hand to do. So I do pray that you do indeed prosper in everything you set your hand to do and that you cling to your roots. Thank you for watching again. Shalom. I am Chris Knight with Love for Yeshua Ministries, and thank you for joining us today as we continue on our series on looking at the spirit of the Torah versus the letter of the Torah. And we're taking a look, taking an episode to look at the fruits of the spirit, one episode per each uh, spirit. Why is that important to us? Well, because we know when we look at the Torah, when we look at the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, that the spirit of Yahweh should be dwelling inside us. It's what allows us to live in His commandments. It's what allows us to walk in His ways. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 22, that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, what does it mean that these things are the fruits of the Spirit? It means if the Spirit of Yahweh is dwelling inside us, we should be seeing these fruits in our lives. And so I think it's important for us as believers in Yeshua, as people who believe in following the Torah and the commandments of God, to check ourselves, to examine ourselves. You know, the series is not to be pointing the finger at other people and looking at who has what and who's wrong on what, but instead to be looking at ourselves and saying, well, if I believe the Spirit of Yahweh is inside me, I should be seeing these fruits popping up in my life. In what ways can I better see these fruits? For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, I want to briefly recap what we've been uh, talking about in this series, especially in the first two episodes regarding the spirit of the Torah. We saw in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that Yahweh says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that departs from the mouth of God shall man live. And we saw that the phrase there actually in Hebrew is, Al kol fi Yahweh yichye ha'adam meaning on everything that exits, on everything that comes forth from the mouth of Yahweh. What comes forth other than His words? His Spirit, His Ruach, His breath. We saw that in the Old Covenant, we stood afar off. When Yahweh spoke the, the first ten statements at Mount Sinai, we stood and we couldn't hear His voice anymore, and we sent Moses to go get the instructions for us. We saw that Yahweh said that when we said that, we couldn't hear his voice anymore. It was actually good. He agreed with us, and he said, the solution is I'm going to send a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brethren, and I'm going to put all my words in him, and he shall teach what I tell him to teach, and whoever doesn't listen to him will be accountable to me. Well, we know this prophet to be our King, Yeshua, the Messiah, who came speaking not his own words, not his own teaching, not reinventing his own religion, but coming with the true teaching and words of the Father. That Yeshua is the Torah made flesh, and he teaches the true spirit of the Torah. We see that in the new covenant in which we are in, in Messiah Yeshua, that we see in Jeremiah 31 and quoted again in Hebrews chapter 8, that he writes the Torah on our hearts and on our minds. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, he says he puts his spirit within us to allow us to walk in his commandments, to allow us to walk in his ways. And so what God did is he changed us from the inside out. He didn't lower his standards. He didn't bring himself down so that we could finally, uh, you know, be in communion and, and one with him. But what he says is, I'm going to renew you and I'm going to take away the heart of stone 
and put a heart of flesh within you. And so in Yeshua, we have this new covenant where he changes us from the inside out and now allows us to be able to walk in his commandments and his ways with the forgiveness of our sins, the forgiveness of our iniquities. So Yeshua, we see him standing up actually during the Feast of Sukkot, and he says, whoever believes on me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, speaking to the Spirit. And the people uh, knew that he was speaking to the Spirit, and they said, this truly is the prophet, the prophet that was prophesied in Deuteronomy, who would bring the words of Yahweh. So now in Yeshua, in the new covenant, with his Spirit in us, we are no longer separated from God, but we're brought near. And we can truly live the Torah the way he intended because the Torah isn't just on the outside. The Torah isn't just the commandments, isn't just, you know, uh, uh, what we see on the outside with the dietary laws and the Sabbath and all this. But the Torah is, in fact, truly spiritual. And Paul says this in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, that the Torah is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So for living a life of Torah, we should see it both on the inside and then as well overflowing to the outside. And so today we're going to continue our series on the fruits of the Spirit, and today we are going to be talking about self-control. One of the most important fruits, one that I have struggled with many times, and I'm sure you can relate as well, self-control is an important thing to, to know and to understand and to learn. So if you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, we are going to begin our study. So the phrase self-control in the Hebrew, it uh, a lot of times it uses the word uh, chazak, to have strength uh, in the hefil form, to have strength over oneself, to be able to, to be strong, to control your will, to control your behavior. Now, self-control is something that the people of God that we have dealt with from the very beginning, it's one of our biggest enemies, is ourself and the lack of control over ourself. Many times, the person that gets us in trouble the most Aren't the people around us, uh, you know, isn't the adversary, but is in fact our own self, our own desires, our own lusts. And so if we turn to Genesis chapter 3 and we look at verses 1 through 7, we see the fall of mankind. We know that when Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, he created it perfect. It was blameless. It was spotless. It was beautiful. There was nothing wrong with it. We walked with God in the garden. Everything was perfect and nice, but then temptation came along. Then the serpent came along, and we have the very first uh, introduction of sin, of departing from God. So we see in Genesis 3, Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which Yahweh had made. And he said to the woman, Now has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the trees of the garden, but not of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, you, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So we see here the very first sin introduced into the world, the beginning of the split between us and God. And what was it dealing with? Self-control. They saw that the food uh, looked really good. It looked like it tasted good. And what the serpent was saying was very attractive. Hey. It's going to make us wise. And so we lusted after the fruit. And we couldn't control our own lust. We couldn't control our own desires, but we gave in. How about you? I don't know about you, but I'm, uh, I'm tempted by good food all the time. And it's something we deal with is self-control. When something looks good to us, when something, you know, hey, I want that. That's going to be beneficial to me. That's going to be good for me. It's hard sometimes to just put the foot down and say, no. And as you can see, we've been dealing with this from the very beginning and from the garden, controlling ourself, controlling our own desires and lusts, messed us up in the very beginning, and it's what knocked us off course and introduced sin, disease, sickness, and even death into the world was because we couldn't control the lust of our eyes and our appetites. We see this again in the very next instance of sin in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 4, 
we read, So Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will, not, you, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. So we see once again Cain dealt with a problem of self-control. He was angry because Yahweh had turned to Abel's offering. Abel's offering was pleasing to Yahweh, Cain's was not. And so he, he had a rage of jealousy and was angry with his brother and he couldn't control his emotions. He couldn't control his passions. And so therefore he kills his brother. And so the very f first few instances we have here in Genesis of sin and all throughout the scriptures really deal with self-control. Can you control the flesh or do you let your flesh run wild? You know, we really do have two natures, those of us who follow God. We have the spirit of Yahweh that dwells in us. We have the spiritual man inside us, but we also have the physical carnal man with its lusts and passions and desires. And we have to be able to control that. We have to be able to strong to have self-control, to not sin, but rather live according to the ways of God. Paul describes this uh, struggle in Romans chapter 7 when he speaks of the difference between the Torah of God and the law of sin and death that wars in his body. In Romans 7, starting with verse 14, look at how Paul describes it, the struggle he's dealing with in his own life. He says, For we know that the Torah is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. And for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that is what I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the Torah of God, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. According to Paul's spirit, he says, I delight in the Torah, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity uh, to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. And so we see that this is something that Paul struggled with. He says, hey, I love the Torah. I agree with the Torah. I think that the Torah is good. I think that it's righteous and just. It's spiritual. But I also have this struggle, these passions and desires in the physical. And sometimes the things that I will not to do, that, that, that I, I preach against, that I don't agree with, I find myself doing. And sometimes the things I think I should be doing, I find myself not doing. And he sees this constant struggle. And we have this idea uh, in Judaism that there are, there are two really wrestling members within us, the Yetzer HaTov and the Yetzer HaRa, the good inclination and the evil inclination in each one of us that are constantly warring against each other. And finally, Paul cries out in frustration, well, what's the solution? He says, Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord, is the solution to the struggle because in Him we have strength to overcome sin. In Him we have the ability to have self-control because remember, all those who rely and have faith in Yeshua as Messiah, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water, which is the Spirit of God. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. So in Yeshua we have the ability to uh, grow in our walk, to mature in our walk, and to learn how to better keep the statutes and control our sin nature and keep our sin nature in check. We see again this idea of uh, self-control in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 6 through 13 where it says, Now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now this passage is speaking about the children of Israel journeying in the wilderness and the constant countless times that they tested God and they complained about food or water or this or that. And he says, And do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us commit, uh, nor let us tempt Messiah, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. So Paul's saying here that these examples in the wilderness, these trials that the children of Israel faced when they complained about water or food or Moses' leadership, these things weren't just written down so we could have a nice read one day. They're written down for us to learn from. They're written down for us to, to grow from and to apply from our own lives. And he said, therefore, you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Well, I have a question for you. Do you think you stand? I think I stand, you know. I, I don't walk around thinking, man, I have everything totally wrong. No, I think, hey, I have faith in Yeshua the Messiah. You know, I, I, I believe in the Torah. I follow his commandments. I'm sure you think the same thing. You think you stand. And he says, for those of us who are pretty confident that, that we're standing on truth, take heed. Pay extra attention. There's no harm in taking heed to these warnings, even when we think we stand. Or else, we might be able to stumble and fall. And finally, in verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. And so Paul gives us words of encouragement here that all these trials and struggles that we go through in our life, none of it is, is beyond reach. None of it is, is just absolutely an insane amount of temptation for us to handle. But he says, all, all the temptation that you go through, Yahweh will never allow you to be bogged down so much to where your only option is sin. He always makes a way of escape. And so we can take a comfort that Yahweh provides a way of escape even when our passions, our lusts, our sinful desires want to rebel, want to go after our own eyes, want to just do whatever looks good to us, whatever makes us uh, happy and feel good. He says Yahweh is always going to provide a way of escape. And we know we have that way in Yeshua the Messiah. We look again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-6, through 6, where we're told to, to take these thoughts captive. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And so we say here that our, our war is really not in flesh. You know, our true enemy is, is, is not Hamas, is not what's going on in the Ukraine, is not these things we see on the outside. Because God is well able to overcome and Messiah says, I have overcome the world. We have nothing to fear. Guys, Yahweh is on our side. God is on our side. But the biggest enemy, the one we need to watch out for, is within us, is the strongholds, the principalities, the things that are going to take us away from God. With God, no outward enemy is going to overcome us. But when our flesh, when our sinful desires start pulling us away from God, that's when we should be concerned. And so he says, take every thought, take every temptation, anything that might urge you to stray from the walk, to stray from Torah, take it captive and make it obedient to Messiah. And you have that ability in Yeshua. We see in the book of James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. This is Yeshua's brother James or, or Jacob if you prefer. Blessed is, is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's an awesome thing to look forward to. I hope to achieve that, and I, I believe you would as well. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, or God, why are you doing this to me? God, I can't handle this. Why are you giving me these temptations? He says, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away 
by his own desires. It's just like it was in the beginning. It's just like it was in Genesis. We are not tempted by God. We are tempted by our own evil desires, our own lusts and passions, which war against God. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own evil desires and enticed. And then in verse 15, he says, Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so we see that temptation is from within. Our true enemy is within ourself. And this is what brings about disease, sickness, death, separation from God. And so we can't put the blame on God, but we truly have to watch within ourself. We see that Yeshua, our Messiah, was indeed tempted and, and went through a, a time of, of fasting and temptation just as we do. And we read about this account in the book of Matthew chapter 4. And so let's take a look there. When we go to Matthew 4, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. It says, Then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you really are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. But Yeshua said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt Yahweh your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Yeshua says to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall only worship Yahweh your God. Him alone shall you serve. And the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So we see that Yeshua himself went through this period where Satan came and attempted to tempt Yeshua, our Messiah. And what was his tool? What was his way of combating the lust of the flesh? What was his tool of combating temptation? It was going straight to the Word. Three times Yeshua quotes from the Torah in response to his temptation of the flesh. So as we have these two uh, uh, people, these, these two inclinations warring inside of us, the evil inclination and the good inclination, whenever sin comes, whenever the desires, the lust, the passions burn within you, we should follow the example of Yeshua, I would say. I would submit to you that He had it right. And we should go to the Word. And we should run to God. And when we pursue Him and we run to Him, we can overcome and avoid the temptations of the flesh. In Romans chapter 6, 11 and 12, Paul said this, Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be deed, uh, dead indeed to sin, just like Messiah was, but alive to God in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Paul said, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And if he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that must mean that we have the ability to overcome. And yeah, sure, sometimes we're going to slip up and fail and lose our ability to self-control, but we keep getting back up, and we get better and better, and we gradually grow in Messiah Yeshua in this walk of the Torah. In Romans chapter 13, verses 13 through 14, Paul says this, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Yeshua Messiah and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We have the flesh, the desires, the lust. And we have the Spirit of God living within us that wants to serve God, just as Paul described his own struggle. The question is, which one are you feeding? When we surround ourselves with, with the things of this world, whether it's the music you listen to, the TV you watch, uh, the things you take enjoyment in, you have the ability to either be feeding sin or to be feeding uh, the Spirit of God that dwells within you. Surround yourself with the things of God and not with the things of this world. We have to know our word. We have to be in prayer. We have to be consumed with things that are good and pure and holy and in the Torah to be able to control ourselves and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if we are constantly surrounding ourselves with the temptations, the odds are much, much higher that we're going to fall to them 
if we're, if we're tempting ourselves more often. James chapter 4, 7 through 8 gives us beautiful words here from James, the brother of Yeshua, or Jacob, if you prefer. He says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. When temptations are coming, when the adversary comes in, resist. Don't give into it. Don't be easy to say yes. Don't make the mistake of Adam and Eve, and because the fruit looks so good, uh, jump in to make that mistake, but in fact, resist. And then he says this in verse 8, beautiful phrase. It should give you comfort. It gives me comfort. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. When we're going through tough times, press into God. Run to him. Don't run from him. Our reaction to sin is always to run away from God and to separate ourselves from God. But notice that Yahweh, his reaction to sin is to have us come back to him. He always calls us to himself. We see that with the temple. We see that in the garden. And so when we have these desires and these lusts and these, these times when we are tempted to fall, run to God. Draw near to him. He will draw near to you and give you peace and the ability to overcome temptation. And so some of you might be feeling, well, you know, I don't know. I struggle with this addiction or that problem or this sin. You know, I always get angry and, and so easily overheated with my brother. I don't know how I can do that. I, I, don't, I don't know how I can walk in the Spirit of God like you're talking about. Well, when we read Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it says this, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so he says, all that's lacking is for you to ask. When you ask, our Father is faithful and He knows how to give good, a good gift and He is very willing to give us the gift of His Spirit, to give us the power to overcome these things and all we have to do is ask our Father. Say, Father, fill me with Your Spirit. Teach me how to truly walk in Your ways and not fulfill the lust of the flesh and He will answer and He will be there to guide you and get you through it. Thanks for joining us today as we looked at the fruits of the Spirit. And we tackled the very last one, self-control. I hope you've enjoyed this series. And if you haven't seen the previous episodes, please, I would encourage you to take a look as each one of these fruits are very important for our lifestyle and our obedience to the one true God, the God of Israel. Uh, please check out the previous episodes or you can find more information on my website, loveforyeshua.com. Thank you so much and be blessed. Shalom. Shalom, I'm Ryan White, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the Joshua Generation Show on Hebraic Roots Network. Help us spread the Word of God to all the nations. You can check us out on the schedule at HebraicRootsNetwork.com to see when our episodes are airing, or you can check us out on demand anytime on the web at HebraicRootsNetwork.com or on your Roku device on your television, you can check us out as well on demand anytime from the comfort of your own living room. I hope to see you there.